All right, gang, listen up. We have arrived at one of my favorite parts of this course. Actually, one of my favorite parts of any classes that I teach. Uh, it's Auditory Transduction Day. Auditory transduction is an incredibly, incredibly cool process. We go from compressions of molecules moving through a compressible medium to the beauty of music, to the sound of a loved one's voice, or my baby's laughter. We understand and process all of those incredibly important complex stimuli through the elegant process of mechanical transduction. So last time we talked about what the nature of the stimulus is, what is sound, how do we describe it and represent it, and today we're going to be talking about how we turn that stimulus into neural code. The process of auditory transduction is, and I'm not overselling this, one of the most beautiful things in the universe. This is one of the wonders of the natural world. I can't wait to tell you about it. So our journey begins, of course, with an ear. The process of transduction begins when sound waves enter the ear and travel through the external auditory canal until they hit the tympanic membrane or eardrum. Uh, if it helps you to remember it, there's a big drum called a tympani, and the tympanic membrane is a lot like the surface of that drum. It's a very thin membrane stretched tightly across the surface. When sound waves contact the tympanic membrane, they cause the tympanic membrane to move, to vibrate. So loud sounds make the tympanic membrane vibrate more, high-pitched sounds make it vibrate faster. So we have so far translated the sound waves into movements in a membrane. So now let's spin it around and look at what's happening on the other side of the tympanic membrane. So it is connected to three tiny bones called the auditory ossicles. The ossicles are called the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. These are the three smallest bones in the human body. Knowing that the stapes is the smallest bone in the human body is likely to get you points at trivia at some point in the future. How do you remember these names? Well, as we go from the outside to the inside, they are called the malleus, incus, and stapes because you wouldn't want to miss, <laughs> malleus, incus, stapes, miss, uh, any of the details about auditory transduction that, that, that you're learning. So as the tympanic membrane vibrates, it causes the ossicles to vibrate, thereby carrying those vibrations deeper into the inner ear. Let's see how it looks. Let's watch it again. Okay, so now we have gone from sound waves to vibrations in a membrane to vibrations in bone. The stapes is connected to the bony labyrinth via a structure called the oval window. And when the stapes presses against the oval window, it, transfer, it transfers the vibrations from the stapes into the oval window and thereby into the bony labyrinth. So that pressure from the stapes moving, um, if we're able to look at the bony labyrinth uh, without the bone on it and just see the liquid that's inside, as the stapes presses against the oval window, it causes movement in the fluid inside the bony labyrinth. Basically, the pressure from that bone moving into the oval window causes waves to start to propagate through the fluid in the bony labyrinth. So we've gone from sound waves to movements in membrane to movements in bone to waves passing through liquid. So now let's zoom in on a cross section and see what's happening inside the cochlea. So the cochlea is this long spiral structure and the waves start near the oval end window and then travel all the way through that spiral up toward the, uh, up toward the apex of the cochlea. When the waves happen, they start low in the tube near the oval window and propagate through the full length of the cochlea. The action of transduction happens here in the organ of corti. So the organ of corti has highly specialized structures in it that respond to waves in the fluid in the cochlea. Two of the really important structures that we're gonna be talking about are the basilar membrane uh, down at the bottom and the tectorial membrane kind of in the middle. Now, there's, there's a common point of confusion, so I want to point out that the organ of corti stretches continuously through the entire length of the cochlea. So if we could look at the basilar membrane within the organ of corti on its own, it, it would look like this on the right. So it's a, continual, it's a continuous uh, like, like spiral moving through the length of the cochlea. It reminds me a lot of like those spiral parking ramps like at malls or the airport. Um, so it is this long continuous structure, even though we typically only look at a cross section of it like this. Okay, so as waves start to happen uh, in the fluid of the cochlea, it can move the membranes inside the cochlea around. 
So here there are waves happening in the fluid and you can see it pushes onto the membranes within the, the organ of Corti. They're, they're rocking in the gentle waves of the, of the cochlear sea. So this has big consequences for some of the structures that are located uh, inside the organ of Corti. Uh, so again, here's our basilar membrane at the bottom, the tectorial membrane at the top, uh, and now we can also see the auditory hair cells, which are embedded in the basilar membrane. So the feet of the auditory hair cells, the bottom of those hair cells, are locked into the basilar membrane, which means that as the basilar membrane moves, the hair cells are going to be lifted up along with it. So now let's zoom in and see what's happening to the tips of those hair cells. As the basilar membrane moves, the stereocilia at the top of the hair cells, shown here, are pressed up against the tectorial membrane. So the hair cells have to move because they're embedded in the basilar membrane and the basilar membrane moves, and that causes those stereocilia to press ever so gently on the tectorial membrane above it. To give you a sense of how incredibly finely tuned this process is, the movement of the stereocilia that ultimately leads to transduction is, is infinitesimal. It is incredibly tiny. As a, as a parallel for size, if the hair cells were as tall as the Eiffel Tower, the amount that the stereocilia move would be equivalent to a half an inch. So this is a tiny, tiny motion that is leading to the process of auditory transduction. So here's an image of the stereocilia under a microscope. Aren't they pretty? Just these little bundles of stereocilia all packed together. So those stereocilia press up against the tectorial membrane, and just as in vestibular transduction, when they are pressed against the tectorial membrane, tip links open ion channels, which allow potassium to enter the stereocilia and depolarize the cell. The schematic for this looks exactly like it does in the vestibular system. You see the same tip link structure, the same kinds of ion channels, um, but it is now the pressure of the stereocilia on the tectorial membrane that are causing the ion channels to open. Unlike the vestibular system, uh, we don't see different directions of motion. That is, we don't have to worry about the kinocilia side and the stereocilia side, because in the auditory system, the, the way that the basilar membrane causes the stereocilia to press up against the tectorial membrane always occurs in the same direction. So it always leads to depolarization. Let's see an animation of how it works. In the absence of stimulation, the ion channels are leaking a little bit of potassium in that's leading to the resting uh, baseline potential. When the ion channels are pulled open by the tip links, lots of potassium rushes in, the, uh, the cell is highly depolarized and action potentials occur. So to summarize, we start with pressure in air that leads to vibration in membrane, that leads to vibration in bone, that leads to movement in a fluid, that leads to vibration in a membrane again, that leads to pressure on hair cells, that leads to depolarization of the hair cells, that leads to action potentials. How cool is that? So this is all a purely physical process. Stuff is bumping into stuff that lets us go from sound waves to action potentials. The process of transduction lets us understand something very interesting that has to do with the sounds of our own voices. You know how when you listen to a recording of yourself, your voice sounds different than it sounds to you when it's live? Okay, and you, and you often have the reaction of like, oh, I sound so terrible. Is that really what I sound like? Here's why that happens. So I've described the process as it typically works, which is through what's called air conduction, meaning sound waves travel through the external auditory canal and get to the structures of the inner ear that way. But when you talk, when your vocal cords vibrate, it also makes the bones in your head vibrate slightly. So me talking right now is making my jaw vibrate a little bit. Oh, you can actually, you can kind of mm, maybe a little bit feel it. Okay. It causes my skull to vibrate uh, all from, from the sound of my voice. Now, bones and other solids uh, transmit lower pitches better than higher pitches meaning that the sounds that reach your ear via bone conduction emphasize low frequencies more than high frequencies. So normally when you hear yourself talk, you're getting both air conduction, right? The sound waves come out of my ear, go in through my external auditory canal, and you're getting bone conduction through those vibrations moving up through your bone. But when you listen to yourself in a recording, you only get the air conduction. The bone conduction isn't there. So this means that your voice sounds lower and richer to you than it does to other people. So on the one hand, I'm telling you that when you hear a recording of yourself, yeah, that's actually what you sound like. And that's hard to hear, especially for someone who is spending hours editing videos of herself. But the good news is that there's likely an, an attentional component of this too. 
When you look at a picture of yourself and the first thing that you think of is like, oh, look how terrible my hair is. Uh, even though if somebody else looks at the picture, they would never notice that thing about your hair, right? Well, likely that same mechanism is at play here. So even though the air conduction is giving you a truer sense of the frequencies that are present in your voice, you're probably a much, a much harsher judge of yourself than others ever would be. I hope, says the lady who's recording hours and hours of videos of her own lectures. The fact that we can hear through bone conductance opens up ways of sound delivery other than through our external auditory canals. So there are now headphones that can send signals directly via bone conduction when you wear them, meaning you can still hear ambient sounds from the environment because you don't have earbuds stuck into your uh, external auditory canals, meaning that it can be safer to listen to them when you also need to be listening for traffic or other uh, noises from the environment. Okay, there is more to go in today's lecture, but if you need a break, stretch your legs. This is a good time to take a break. Intermission. I'm back. All right, so we have now talked about how we go from sound waves to action potentials. But the missing piece of the puzzle is that we need a way to distinguish between different qualities of the sound. So how do we code for high-pitched and low-pitched sounds? How do we distinguish between quiet and loud sounds and so forth? So the auditory system does this in a few different ways. We're not gonna talk about all of these mechanisms in this class, but we'll talk about one way that the system codes for frequency and two ways that we code for intensity. Okay, so the first challenge is, how do we know if we're hearing a high-pitched sound or a low-pitched sound? Let's zoom back to our schematic of the basilar membrane and the hair cells. So the basilar membrane here is shown in green. If we could just see it and nothing else in the cochlea, it's like a long spiral ramp. And as you read, different regions of the basilar membrane respond most robustly to different frequencies. So the apex of the cochlea responds most robustly to, to low frequencies, and the base responds most robustly to high frequencies. Note that these names correspond to the shape of the cochlea. So the base means the area that is closest to the oval window, uh, but base is for high-pitched sounds. That name is not terribly intuitive. So if you hear a, a very high pitched sound near the threshold of human hearing, 20,000 Hertz, uh, it causes an area near the base of the cochlea to respond most robustly. The hair cells embedded there will fire more than hair cells anywhere else in the basilar membrane. Uh, conversely, if you hear a really low pitched sound, the hair cells that are embedded in the basilar membrane near the apex will respond most robustly. So if we could see depolarizations, this is what it would look like. Okay, so this means if we, if we could see the depolarizations, we'd see this neat and tidy pattern of action potentials coming from different regions of the basilar membrane that respond to different pitches. So the next question is, why does the base respond to high frequency sounds and the apex respond to low frequency sounds? It has everything to do with the shape and nature of the basilar membrane. If we could unroll the cochlea and look inside at the basilar membrane, we'd see that the base of the basilar membrane and the apex of the basilar membrane are physically different from one another. The base is narrower and thicker, and the apex of the basilar membrane is wider and more pliable and floppier. My internal mental model of this is that it's like a, like a scuba diver's flipper, right? The apex is really wide and floppy, and the base is rigid and, and thick and, and narrow. So when high frequency sounds reach the basilar membrane, it causes the base of the, of the basilar membrane to respond more. The base moves more when high frequency sounds are present. If I play a really low frequency sound, that wide, floppy, pliable apex moves more. So the, the physical properties of the basilar membrane are what cause it to displace differently in response to different sounds. So it is, in effect, separating sounds like an acoustic prism. It is taking a complex sound and splitting it up into component frequencies based on which regions of the basilar membrane respond or move uh, based, on, based on that frequency. A key point is that the hair cells embedded down the length of the basilar membrane are the same. So what causes them to respond preferentially is not a feature of the hair cell itself, it's a feature of the basilar membrane. So the hair cells are identical throughout the length of the basilar membrane, but they respond differently because the basilar membrane moves differently at different regions, uh, at different regions within the cochlea. So here's what it would look like. Mm -hmm. 
we describe the frequencies that particular cells respond to as being their characteristic frequency. So that is the frequency that causes a particular neuron to fire most robustly. And again, it's not anything about the neuron. It's really about the basilar membrane. Uh, I think of the characteristic frequency as like being each neuron's favorite frequency. When they hear that frequency, they get super excited and fire at high rates. Now, it's not the case that individual neurons only respond to one single frequency, but they do respond most robustly to one single frequency. So if we were to select a, a, a neuron somewhere in the middle, um, closer to the apex side, that neuron might respond the most robustly to 1500 hertz. But it will also likely respond a little bit to 1000 hertz or 2000 hertz. So this tonotopic coding is one of the primary ways that we code for which frequencies of sound are present simply by looking at which, which of the hair cells along the length of the basilar membrane are firing. Okay, so how do we code for intensity? Well, one way that the auditory system codes for intensity is via the rate at which auditory hair cells are firing. So tonotopic coding for frequency is which hair cells are firing. Uh, rate coding for intensity is how much are they firing. Now, when we have no sound present, the hair cell is gonna be firing at its baseline rate. A very quiet sound will lift the basilar membrane up just a little bit, meaning that the stereocilia will press ever so gently on the tectorial membrane. Those ion channels will open a small amount for a short amount of time and some, some potassium will enter. This will lead to some depolarization. But if we have a high intensity sound, it's going to cause greater deflection of the basilar membrane. The basilar membrane is lifted up more. That means the stereocilia are going to be jammed harder against the tectorial membrane. The ion channels are going to be open more and for longer, meaning more potassium is going to enter the cell and the cell is going to have a higher firing rate. So louder sounds are associated with faster firing rates, all else equal. But a second mechanism by which we code for intensity is how many neurons are firing, known as population coding. You may have heard of this one before. I said before that when sounds are of a higher intensity, it leads to more movement of the basilar membrane. This also means that more neurons are activated along the basilar membrane than would have been for a quiet sound. So if a quiet sound stimulates this chunk of the basilar membrane, a louder sound is going to stimulate a larger section of the basilar membrane, meaning more neurons are going to be firing in response to it. So this means that neurons will respond to frequencies that are far different from their characteristic frequency if a sound is loud enough. So, so here's an example. Let's say this little guy's uh, characteristic frequency is 2000 hertz. When a 3000 hertz tone is played, let's say that here, if it is quiet, the 2000 hertz tone is not likely to respond. That region of the basilar membrane is not going to be heavily moved by that 3000 hertz tone. But if that 3000 hertz tone is really loud, now the hair cell with a characteristic frequency of 2000 hertz is going to respond because that region of the basilar membrane will move in response to the 3000 hertz sound. So in order to determine the frequency and amplitude of sounds that are present, we have just a couple of degrees of freedom, a couple of different ways that the neural code can differ. Which neurons are firing? Tonotopic coding, where on the basilar membrane they're firing, how fast they're firing, rate coding, and how many of them are firing at once, population coding. So this is how we code for frequency and intensity. But as we talked about last time, most of the sounds that we hear are not pure tones that are going to be activating one region of the basilar membrane at once, right? Typically, we are hearing many frequencies at once. So if we go back to our unrolled basilar membrane, let's see how it responds to complex notes that are full of harmonics. Those are the simple ones. Yeah, gang, this process isn't just happening in one place at the basilar membrane at once. Different regions are responding in different ways simultaneously. So to, to put all this together, we're going to combine what we did last time talking about complex, uh, uh, talking about complex notes, harmonics, fundamental frequencies, and so forth um, with, with what we've just talked about today. So to do this, we're going to use this schematic of the basilar membrane. The basilar membrane is, is, uh, would be right here, shown in red. 
uh, and we can map out how various regions of the basilar membrane would respond to different types of notes. So we're just going to draw lines that indicate the firing rate of auditory hair cells at different regions of the basilar membrane from base to apex. So for instance, if we played a very quiet, high frequency, pure tone, we would see a small increase in firing rate in a small group of cells near the base. If we were to turn up the volume on that tone, and now we have a loud high pitched tone, we would see that the firing rate of those hair cells near the base would increase, but also a larger number of hair cells is now responding above baseline than was before. So this represents both uh, rate coding, larger number firing, and population coding, more neurons firing simultaneously. Those signals are then carried up the auditory nerve. Uh, they relay in thalamus and travel via a, via a primarily contralateral path up to auditory cortex in the temporal lobe, shown here as, as A1. Now, that beautiful tonotopic coding of the auditory pathway uh, is maintained all the way up to auditory cortex. So the basilar membrane via tonotopic coding uh, lets us know which frequencies are present, and that tonotopic organization is maintained in, in auditory cortex. That means that regions of auditory cortex near the front of your brain uh, respond most robustly to low frequencies, so that is they are getting signals from the cochlea apex, and the region near the back corresponds to the cochlea base. So what that means is that if I were to insert an electrode into your auditory cortex and present just a very slight electrical current, enough to allow the cells there to, to depolarize, I could make you hear different pitches depending on where in the brain I stimulated. You've got like a keyboard laid out in your head. When you hear a piano scale from going from low to high, it's literally causing activation to run from the front of your auditory cortex to the back. All right, so to summarize, auditory transduction is mechanical and amazing. We code for frequency via tonotopic coding and intensity via rate and population coding. Multiple regions of the basilar membrane and auditory cortex are activated simultaneously for complex sounds. All right, that is it for today. I look forward to seeing you in class and hearing more about what you think about this. All right, I'll let you check your answers to these first ones. For the last sentence, I would accept beautiful, elegant, or incredible as a correct answer. All right, so when you have a cold or an ear infection, sounds often sound more muffled than they normally do. This happens because the area surrounding the ossicles can get inflamed and full of mucus, and that hampers or limits how much the ossicles can move. So rather than having nice big movements associated with loud noises, the ossicles are cramped and can't move very much, meaning sounds aren't carried as clearly from outside the head to, to inside it. This can also happen from other forms of external damage, like uh, having a perforated or torn eardrum, um, meaning the, the tympanic membrane doesn't move the way it normally would. We'll talk more about noise-induced hearing loss, ringing in your ears after concerts, age-induced hearing loss, and other forms of, of damage to the auditory system a bit later in this unit. So the quiet high-pitched sound will activate a narrow band uh, near the base of the basilar membrane, whereas the loud low-pitched sound will activate a wider band of the basilar membrane near the apex. The lowest frequencies of the piano are the loudest and they get gradually quieter. So the activation of the firing rate that we're gonna see is gonna be highest at the apex and for each of the harmonics gets slightly narrower and more finely tuned. For the clarinet, the fundamental frequency, the third harmonic, and the fifth harmonic uh, are loud, whereas the second and fourth are relatively quiet. That means that the areas of the basilar membrane that correspond to those quieter sounds will have lower firing rates and more finely tuned firing rates. So the threshold of audibility is the quietest sound that you can detect at each frequency. Damage that reduced sensitivity near the base would cause increased thresholds for high frequency sounds. Increased thresholds means that the sound has to be louder in order for you to perceive that it is there. Reduced sensitivity near the apex would increase thresholds for low frequency sounds. Presbycusis increases thresholds for everything, but particularly for high frequency sounds. 
We'll talk more about age-related hearing loss uh, in a few class periods, but as we age, not only does it get harder to hear all frequencies, but it gets more difficult particularly to hear those really high frequency sounds. All right, that is it for today. I can't wait to hear what your questions are.